Hi, I'm Jonathan Fields, and this is Good Life Project. My guest today is iconic designer Milton Glaser and founder of New York Magazine. Really excited to dive into this conversation. So we're sitting here today in, in a room surrounded by uh, incredible art, incredible design, um, probably years and years of work. And uh, it, it, it's almost, it's interesting to me because I almost don't know where to dive in. But one of my curiosities is, is where did this all come from? And I'm curious, you know, when I think about your body of work, going way, way, way back before it, there was a body of work, mm-hmm. what were you like as a kid? Where does this, where does the seed of this come from? Are you going to continue to ask me questions that can't be answered? <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my best. I, I, I have no idea where it comes from. The only thing that I do know is that after a while, you begin to realize, A, how little you know about everything, mm. and two, how vast the brain is and how it encompasses everything you can imagine, but more than that, everything you can't imagine. And what is, uh, what is perhaps central to this is the impulse to make things, mm. which seems to me to be a primary characteristic of human beings, the desire to make things, whatever they turn out to be. And then supplementary to that is the desire to create beauty, which is a different but analogous activity. So the urge to make things probably is a survival device. The urge to create beauty is something else. Uh, but only apparently something else, because, as you know, there are no unrelated events in human experience. So, uh, beauty, and I've said this before, but beauty, uh, the creation of it, is a survival mechanism. There's something about making things beautiful, and we sometimes call that art, that has something to do with uh, creating a commonality between human beings so that they don't kill each other. And uh, whatever that impulse is and wherever it comes from, it certainly is contained within every human being I've ever met. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the opportunity to articulate it occurs. Sometimes it remains dormant for a lifetime. You just don't get the shot at it. But uh, I've been very lucky. I I imagined myself as a maker of things uh, from the age of five. Mm. I realized that uh, to make something was miraculous. And uh, I never stopped. I just kept making things all my life, whatever they were, whatever category you chose to put them in whether they uh, attain the status or official status of art is another story but that is uh, a set of other conventions but the desire to make things is a profound human characteristic mm, i completely agree w- was there was there something that happened at the age of 5 or was it a gradual awakening around then that you seemed to really key in on a moment well i have a canned story about that which is why i <laughs> I feel uh, reluctant to tell it again because I've told it so many times, sometimes on film. But what really happened, and this, this was uh, an event. Um, I, my parents were going out, I grew up in the Bronx, and my parents were going out to some ceremonial occasion and left me at home to be taken care of by my cousin, who must have been 16 or 17 years old, who came to the house. My parents left and he was uh, carrying a brown paper bag and after we sat down in the living room he said you want to see a bird and i thought immediately that he had a bird in the bag and i said yes and he reached into the bag and he pulled out a pencil and he drew a bird on the side of the bag and for one reason or another I think it was the first time I'd ever seen anybody draw something that looked like the object depicted. I mean, I'd seen kids in kindergarten drawing things that didn't look like 
a bird, but, but I suddenly realized that you could create life, that you could create life with a pencil and a brown paper bag. And it was truly a miracle in my recollection Although people are always telling me that memory is just a mm -hmm. device to justify your present. I really, it was like receiving the stigmata. I suddenly realized that you could spend your life inventing life. And I never stopped, that at five, my course was set. I never deviated, mm -hmm. I never stopped aspiring or working in a way that uh, that provided the opportunity to make things that if you did right, move people. Mm. Which is interesting too, I mean, because you, you know, you, you grew up in essentially post-depression and then World War II in the Bronx. And um, there was certainly ample need to create moments that touched people and, and work that touched people. But also, I, I wonder at that time in our country's history, whether, and in your mind, whether doing this was something where you said, this is something that I could get paid for and build a career around, or this is just, this is what I need to do, and this is my service. Well, uh, characteristically, I had a very good uh, dynamic. Uh, my mother was relentlessly approving of anything I did. Mm. Uh, I just thought everything I did was marvelous. And my father was worried about my making a living and was very reluctant mm -hmm. to even think that I might choose a life in the arts because he wanted me to f pursue a life that would basically have some financial security. Or mm. so. a, a kind of simple idea, but... Uh, during the Depression, very prevalent. I mean, there was a time when making a living was really tough. He had a dry cleaning store, and I used to deliver orders. Very often that consisted of carrying four winter coats up six flights of stairs uh, and getting a nickel tip. Mm. So I couldn't imagine that a life of an artist would be much more difficult than, mm. than that. <laughs> At any rate, the, the combination of my father's resistance and my mother's support was the perfect environment because I learned to overcome resistance and I was convinced by my mother that I could do anything. Mm. An ideal psychic environment for accomplishing something in the world. Yeah. What led you to... Um in your mind, you're creating art. Um, do you remember sort of the first glimpse of the the experiences of, of I'm doing this for me and I love it and there's something that I'm just drawn to um, versus people are responding to it? It's an interesting and, and complicated question because uh, I began uh, using my drawings of a means of ingratiating myself with uh, other young people. I mean, I, would, I was the class artist, mm -hmm. so designated when I was six years old. I, it's funny, and all through uh, public school, I was always the class artist. Mm -hmm. It was a funny idea, right? And I would do drawings as a kind of service activity for my friends, mostly drawings of naked girls at a time when we didn't quite know what that was. Uh, but I always saw myself as being a uh, facilitator of other people's needs in that mm. very primitive way. I liked the fact that I had status, I had a position in life, uh, and I could also be of service in a strange way, although I, I never thought of it as being of yeah, service. As a kid, but right. I mean, yeah. that I did something that gave me some privilege in the, that group. Mm. The, that designation was a useful one to me in terms of developing my own sense of who I was. Uh, so when, when you reach a point where 
um, you decide that, well, this is something that I could potentially do beyond high school. This is something I could build my life around. And it sounds like you had already, in your mind, made that decision when you were five or six. <laughs> yes. But then you have to work out the details. Uh, um, absolutely. Uh, there, was no, there was no doubt in my mind what I was going to do, ever. How do, you, how do you come to the place of deciding what that outlet is going to be? You know, how do I take this and, and I'm, I'm, I'm the class artist, you know, and I know this is in my soul. In some way, or, or I, I have to make, I have to create. I have to, I have to make and I have to create beauty. This is right. what I'm here to do. Um, and there are a lot of different directions you could have gone with that. You could have gone fine art. You could have gone so many different directions. Yeah. Um, what led you to choose the sort of path that you've been creating? Again, you're asking me questions that are fundamentally yeah. unanswerable. But I would, I would say that it didn't matter to me as long as... I, that, that categorical distinction between the arts is nonsensical. Mm. Stupid, in fact. But useful to uh, society for one reason or another. Uh, I might have become a painter, I might have become a dress designer, I might have become an architect, I mean, all of those possibilities. I, I knew I wanted to make things. And then circumstances began to intervene and interrupt that vague decision and opportunities which I was willing to seize regardless of uh, whatever the consequences. So. I um, I have to tell you the story, which is very instrumental in that uh, decision, and uh, even though it's, it's sort of part of my official range of stories, it was uh, so profound that I I have to tell it just in order to express how uh, how twenty seconds can change your life. When I was in junior high school, I had the opportunity to take the entrance examination to either Bronx Science, which is a great New York school, sure. or the High School of Music and Art, which is another great yeah. New York school, neither of which are sufficiently appreciated for how they shape the city. I mean, these are both incredibly important institutions in terms of New York's population and environment, and so on. And, uh, I had a science teacher who was very encouraging for me to enter into science. I was very good in science. And he wanted me to go to Bronx Science. And uh, I was evasive about that because I didn't want to tell him that it ain't going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> but the day of the entrance exam, they, they occurred on the same day I took the entrance examination to the High School of Music and Art. And uh, the next day when I came back to school, I, uh, he was in the hallway as I was walking down and he said, uh, I want to talk to you. And I said, uh-oh, oh. the jig is up. He's, he's okay. going to find out I took the wrong exam. Uh, he said, come to my office, sit down. And as I was sitting there, he said, um, I hear you took the exam for music and art. And I said, oh, yes. And then he reached over and he reached into his desk and he pulled out a box of French Conte crayons, rather fancy, expensive box. And he gave it to me and he said, do good work. And uh, I can't tell that story without crying. Because uh, it was uh, such a profound example of somebody who, an adult, authority figure, a uh, sophisticated man, who was willing to put aside his own desire for something, I mean, his own uh, direction for my life, and recognize me as a person who had made a decision and he was, instead of just simply acknowledging it, he was encouraging it mm. with this incredibly gracious and generous gift. And I never forgot that story. I, you know, I was, I don't know, 14, 15 years old. But that kind of, the thing about it that always astonishes you in your life 
is that moment, it couldn't have taken more than two minutes, all right? It was totally transformative about my view of life, my view of others, my view of education, my, my view of acknowledging the other. Yeah. And uh, it was a very important moment for me. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's interesting to me also as a parent because, you know, everyone says, what does a parent want for their child? Well, they want them to be happy. All right. But, but above that, I think before that, we want them to be safe. Sure. You know, and then we want them to be happy. And I think, so we have this kind of ongoing conversation in our heads. Yeah. This may make them happy, but this may make them, is more likely to make them safe. Yeah. You know, so, and there's this risk that we're sort of going and, and, and so it's interesting when you share this story because I, I think of that person, you know, like sort of playing a, a similar role and saying, you know what, I, I'm choosing happiness yeah. and whatever will happen will happen. Well, if you learn more and more that everything exists at once with its opposite. So mm. the contradictions of life are never ending and the, uh, Somehow the mediation between these opposites are the game of life. Mm, yeah. It, I, um, I'm asked often, and I'm, I'm sure you are also, you know, through your teaching, what if I choose wrong? What? What if I choose wrong? And, uh, oh, you know, yeah. like, what if I, what if that wasn't the right, and... and and it's an interesting conversation because, uh, you know, I think the more I think about it and the more I explore life, um, I, less and less I believe there is a wrong choice. You know, it's more, um, it's more important to choose right. and just see what happens. Well, it is. And you could also develop your own understanding by seeing what choices you've made. And, you know, uh, some people, you know, are constantly complaining about their life and the wrong choices they made. And at one point you say to them, well, stop making those stupid choices. <laughs> I mean, so first acknowledge that you make stupid choices yeah. and then see if you want to do something about it. Maybe you don't. And evidently, you don't. Right. So be satisfied in your stupid choices. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, without being arrogant about it. But you realize that the the first step is always, in the Buddhist sense, to acknowledge what is. Mm. And that's very hard to do. Mm. It's, it's very hard to do. It is. But incidentally, uh, drawing and attentiveness is one of the ways you do that. I mean, the great uh, benefit of drawing, for instance, is that when you look at something you see it for the first time. Mm. And you can spend your life uh, without ever seeing anything. No. It, it's interesting that as, as you're sharing this in the background, we're starting to hear the voices of children mm -hmm. playing outside. Yeah, it's almost, it's outside. like, it's the perfect compliment to sort <laughs> of like this topic because you know, what better representation of being here and like seeing what's in front of you than when you're this big and if we could carry that forward but for so many people I feel like it some way we, we lose that oh we do and, and you have to uh, I mean I do I, 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 I can sound as though I, I know the answer to these things I don't know the answer to anything I mean you have to constantly be attentive to what you deflect in life and what you don't pay attention to and all the things that you can't see and all the preconceptions that you do have about everything. And those preconceptions basically blur your vision. You, you, mm. It's very hard to see what's in front of you. Yeah, I, I, I remember hearing once when uh, told uh, that I couldn't draw, the, the response that, you know, it's not that you can't draw, it's that you can't see. That everyone can draw, you know, it's, it's sure. about, can you actually see? Yeah. what's in front of you, rather than seeing sort of like the image that has already been planted in your mind about what it's yeah. supposed to look like. Yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, 
it's a shame that educationally now I've been teaching for an awfully long time, and uh, because of, to some extent, the technology, the computer, and, and so on, and the concern to uh, massive programs and so on, that this most fundamental act of anyone uh, in and out of the arts, which is uh, a desire to understand what they're looking at, which involves looking, seeing the brain transformation, the neurological path that moves from the brain to the hand. I mean, someone said the hand is a thinking instrument. And I have a book called Drawing is Thinking. Mm -hmm. And that has been omitted from uh, art education in most places, not all places at a great loss to uh, understanding. Mm -hmm. Even when you manage the technological needs that you have to uh, produce things for the society, uh, the idea that drawing is a way of developing your ability to think uh, doesn't seem to be sufficiently yeah. conclusive. Yeah, and it's so interesting for me also as, as a writer. Um, for a long time I would do all my writing on a computer. Right. And then I would hit a point where I would just kind of need to step out. And then I started taking you know, a little moleskin book with me. And I would just sit somewhere in a park. I would go to you know, a bar or just sit and just write longhand. Right. And, and at first my hand started to ache because right. I literally lost sure. the muscles to be able to actually write. Sure. And then what I started to realize was that, that that change actually really changed my output. That what, came, what channeled through me onto the page when I was writing by hand was very different creatively than what came through my fingers Absolutely. onto the keyboard. And that's, uh, that surprised me, it really did. Absolutely. But everything changes everything. Yeah. I mean, there are no independent events. I mean, there's, I use a computer every day now. I, use, I love the computer, um, but I never touch it. <laughs> I mean, I have somebody at my side, and I say, make that bigger, make that smaller. Uh -huh. right. But I also use the computer. Uh, right now, I'm doing a series of prints for a show I'm going to have next year. And I use a computer like a lithographic press. I spent years doing lithography. And I just think of the computer as a press that operates at a different speed. Mm. Because when you do a lithograph, you have to do a drawing, etch it, prepare a stone, transfer it to the stone, print the proof, mm. look at the proof, and so on. All of which will take you a day. And in order to get five different color proofs, it'll take you a month to do a print. I can do all of that in a day on the computer mm -hmm. by simply being able to determine what color goes on what color right. on, on the computer itself rather than the old technology. But if I didn't know that old technology, the computer would be useless to me. Right. So it's a, the, the interaction between, also the need for speed is a separate issue entirely of, of, because in the case of uh, work that you do on the computer, speed is uh, a factor because it's an economic factor. But in the world of art, speed is irrelevant. Nice. So you have two very different objectives there. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I, I recently, um, there's a letterpress shop out in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and uh, I recently went out there and, and took a class to learn how to use these letter presses that they, you know, they had to go and find from the 50s and bring in, so mm -hmm. they had you know, like really good machines. And there is something so, I mean, when you sit there and you choose the paper and you lay the blocks, you know, and you ink the roller, and the, you just let you roll it through, mm -hmm. and you roll it back, and you hold it up, mm -hmm. and you feel it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's such a different, process and it's so it you feel it sorry <laughs> banging the microphone a bit yeah. you um you feel it so differently and so deeply yeah. it's it's this visceral deep thing that's 
um, I could spend all day writing or creating on sure. the computer, but I won't get that. Yeah. You know, so it's it's an amazing thing to to move back to to these sort of ways to make. It is, and and the virtual world has created a very different kind of nervous system for people who mm. spend their life in that world. And it produces a different sense of appropriateness, of time, of morality, of ethics, of behavior. Mm. I mean, I was, uh, I, I've cited this before, but I was at dinner with my wife and we sat down next to a table with four people and they each had cell phones and they were all talking to somebody outside the restaurant. That kills me. I say, <laughs> What's what's going on there? I mean, why would you be talking to somebody outside the restaurant and not even looking at the people at your table? And when did that become appropriate? I mean, if you were on the telephone f for a meal with four different people talking to four others outside, you would, when I was growing up, right, you, it would be incomprehensible. Right. Not only is it comprehensible now. It's unavoidable. Right. Uh, I mean, when I was a kid, you, you weren't, if the phone rang and the family was having dinner, you didn't pick up the phone. Right. You know? Right. So what shifted that perception uh, of what's the right thing to do? And it's, there's something really weird about it. I mean, and I always, I'm wondering as a really uh, retard, a technological retard, who are all these people in the streets talking to <laughs> well, in the middle of traffic? as they're trying to cross. I mean, what is it that makes every conversation so yeah. urgent that it can't wait until they stop the crossing? I mean, I, it, I don't get it. it you know, I th I th but I think what, because I, I agree, I think what that technology does, on the one hand, it connect, it flattens the world, which is wonderful. I can talk to people on different continents. Absolutely. And so it opens up this cultural you know, divide, but at the same time, it, it often disconnects us from the people at the dinner table right in front of For us. Sure. And, and, you know, what you were talking about, people constantly on, is that, you know, for, to me, my, the, the biggest creative, the biggest ideas don't come to me when I'm working hard at getting them. They come when I step away from the work. You know, oh, when, I'm in, sure. when I'm in the woods, when I'm just, when I create pauses yeah. in my day. And yeah. I get concerned because we're filling every possible pause with you know, connecting. Yeah. And what is that going to do to what we're capable of creating in the world? Well, we don't know. I mean, the the, the uh, thing we don't understand, you never know, fish and water doesn't know it's in water. We don't know what this is doing to the human right. psyche or to human behavior or to any of it. We know it's changing. We know it'll be a profound change. It won't be what it was, but we don't know what the nature of that will finally be. It probably have some benefits and significant drawbacks, but it is just emerging. The you are creating a new kind of person. Yeah, I agree. I mean, literally kind of rewiring the brain. Yeah. No. Uh, I'm curious when you um, when you look at the work that you're creating, and when you when you start to make decisions um, about what am I going to do, what am I not going to do, what what's important to you? about um, what you choose to work on? What are the sort of the qualities that, that draw you to work or to, that light you up and say, this is something I want to, I want to do or be involved in? Uh, well, that's a, a, a question that's a little more specific boundary. Yeah, I, I mean, so if, if somebody came with a project, yeah. um, you know, and, and you're, you know, you're a busy person, you've got limited time, um, and you need to say yes or no. Um, so, you know, my curiosity is in your head. What is it about? Is it about a project? Is it a product or work? Or is it the team or the individuals or the opportunity for you to explore something just yourself that may not be related even to it? Well, that makes you say yes. Uh, it's a dialectic. I don't think it's one thing. I don't think yeah. it's ever one thing. It's like, why do you like this person? Well, I like this and this, and the, but I don't like this and this. And, I always say the, the question of human affection is so complicated. Why do you like certain people and don't like other people? You go into a room and you say, yes, 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 no, no, no. <laughs> You've already made up your mind who you can get along with and who you can't. And I have a sort of in my book of principles or my 10 principles of work, 
the first one is always work with people you like. Mm. And that's simple, really simple-minded, but fundamentally profound. Mm. I mean, you can't, it's, and this is not entirely true, you can't work with people you don't like. Sometimes there's a kind of dislike that urges you to overcome your mm. own and limitations. It becomes, becomes fuel to a certain extent. Yeah. I would say that now getting work is a co always a combination of factors. One is, A, uh, the first thing is if the work is harmful, I don't do it. I mean, do no harm is, I think, a principle that does not only apply to the medical profession. Uh, which is say to urge people to do what is harmful to them is something that I don't feel comfortable doing. Uh, the other thing is whether the, there's really an opportunity to make something good out of it as opposed to fulfilling a task. Professional life is very often antithetical to artistic life because mm -hmm. in professional life you basically repeat what you already know, you repeat your previous yeah. successes. It's like marketing. Marketing is the enemy of art because it is always based on the past. Not that art is always based on the future, but it's very often based on transgression. So when you do something that basically is guaranteed to succeed, you are basically closing the possibility for discovery. So there's that. And I do jobs purely, purely for professional reasons because they know how to do certain things mm. that will be effective and will work, and that serves me as a professional. And then I do jobs where I don't know what I'm doing, or I do projects where I don't know what I'm doing. I'm doing that now for uh, a show that I'm going to have in Cincinnati next year. I decided to do a series of landscape prints, and I'm doing them on the computer uh, in part, I'm taking drawings and then s subjecting them to the computer mm. to see if I can produce something that doesn't look as though it was generated by the computer. Because the computer is a dangerous instrument because it shapes your capacity to understand what's possible. The computer is, a, is like a uh, apparently submissive servant that mm. turns out to be a subversive that ultimately gains control of your mind. The computer is such a powerful instrument that it uh, it defines, after a while, what is possible for you. And what is possible is within the computer's capacity. And while it seems at the beginning like this incredibly gifted and talented service, it actually has a very limited intelligence. The brain is so much vaster than the computer, but the computer is very insistent about what it's good at. Mm. And before you know it, it's, it's like being with somebody who has bad habits. You sort of fall into the bad habits, and it begins to dominate the way you think of what is possible. So now, because I never touch the computer, I'm taking advantage of it. Hmm. So how? by doing things that are uncomfortable for it to do. <laughs> so you have to give me more. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm treating it like it were a printing press instead of uh, like an advanced electronic instrument. Right. I can show you, but uh, on the way out. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, it's fascinating. So it's essentially... Reverse, a little bit of role reversal there. <laughs> You're owning it instead of being owned by it. Um, when, when you think about um, how people are being trained, there's been a lot of really interesting pushback these days against art school, formal art education. Um, as somebody who's an artist, a designer, and a teacher, I'm curious just what your feelings are. Uh, what, what do you mean by pushback in this case? Meaning people saying it's it's not necessary. That, art education is not yeah, necessary. Yeah, that sort of formal art education that... Um, for what purpose? For in order to, I guess, become good at your craft, become good enough so that you can build a living doing it. Well, you have to separate uh, making a living, hmm. which is one activity, 
and one that everybody has to face with enlarging one's understanding of the world mm. and also providing an instrumentality for people to have, as I said earlier, a common purpose and a sense of uh, transformation. I went up to the Morgan Library the other day mm. having a show of uh, old, it's called Old Master Drawings or master drawings in any case. Uh, fantastic drawing. I saw Cezanne there that I had never seen, a uh, pencil of watercolor of a landscape. And uh, I was transformed. I looked and my world was enlarged. Mm -hmm. At this ancient age, I was still capable of astonishment, of feeling, my God, I've never had this experience before. And that is what the arts provide, the sense of enlargement and the sense that you haven't come to the end of your understanding, uh, either of yourself or of other things. So that's why art was invented and that's why practitioners who have occasionally, the experience of making such objects, feel that they are part of a larger issue than the immediate context of their life. I mean, they're part of human history. And I was thinking, for any reason, because a friend had recently died, uh, it's nice to feel that you left something behind. Mm. When you which is kind of fascinating because, um, so I'm 47 and uh, yeah, I'm married, I have a, a daughter. And um, it's interesting that I find myself now thinking about legacy. Um, you know, still believing that I have many decades left to create work. Sure. But it's creeping into my every day at sure. this point. And it's a little bit surprising in, in, in an odd way. Well, you don't, I mean, I, I, I you don't necessarily have to think of it as legacy. That sort of gives a kind of <laughs> right, a, a, right. an overtone to it. Right. But, but the idea of, of, like, of, what's of the body doing of good work, work building. Yeah. right? Of doing yeah. good work. I mean, there's something about that, the simplicity of that statement. And uh, I think, I'm not sure, but I think it was Freud who said, love and work, that's all there is. And that's pretty much true. Germinating on that. <laughs> um, yeah, I need to spend more time on that. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So, um, so th the name of this project is is the Good Life Project, and uh, it's an exploration of you know, do we know what any of the pieces are and. And one of the questions that I always ask when I, when I have an opportunity to sit down with someone like you is, in, in your experience, when I offer the term to live a good life, what comes up? A significant life? <sighs> well, first of all, significant to whom? I mean, uh, If you're thinking in terms of the history of the world, that's one thing. If you're thinking in terms of a family that managed to grow up and support itself and live a full life and do no harm, every life is significant. Uh, some more than others. There are heroic figures in uh, history chosen either for real heroism or real importance or for some illusion of status. I was thinking about the Pope, this unexpected uh, modesty. Uh, who am I to, you know, condemn another human being? 
you know, the yeah. quote about gay people. Yeah. And I was thinking, yeah, well, that's, that's a good question. Who are you to condemn anybody else? I mean, we elevate these people to heroic roles or significant roles. It's just another guy living, trying to make sense of getting old and dying. Hmm. That's it. I mean, we're all in the same boat. So, but it was shocking to hear that coming from someone who'd been anointed with this false illusionistic idea that this person somehow is more knowing than every other human being. I'm sorry. It's a self-serving delusion, but obviously useful because it persists so much. Hmm. I'm, I'm curious, do you, do you see a good life and a significant life as one and the same? I, I am very suspicious of some words like that and, and also what they link to. I, I guess I feel now that uh, you can't take anything at face value. You have to go beyond the superficiality of existing belief. Uh, my favorite quote is, certainty is a closing of the mind. Mm. And so, I don't know what a, a good life is. A good life, uh, uh, for me, certainly has, uh, has been uh, the things that I think are important are friendships that I have, people I love, and certainly a, a marriage that has endured uh, and that continues to endure, teaching, which I've been doing for about well over half a century, and uh, feeling that whatever you know has the possibility of being transmitted and shared. Outside of that, I wouldn't know how to define a good life. And as you know, some people seem to be villains to some and heroes to another. I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, what's so interesting to me is I've I've asked this question now. We're you know more, over a year into this exploration, and um, initially I would have guessed that after about. 10, 11, 12 conversations, there would be a lot of repetition. Mm -hmm. There hasn't been. There has that's interesting. Which is really, it's been fascinating to me, yeah. is that the lens is so unique to everybody's experience. Well, what is the most recurring idea, though? Um, service is in various ways. Um, I mean, that idea I am not only for myself. Yeah, um, gratitude yeah. in various, under, by various names. Yeah. Um, there are two things that uh, recur um, in different ways. Yeah. In different ways. Yeah. Well, in, in one way, certainly in, in terms of gratitude, I feel enormously grateful for uh, the life I've led. I've had an extraordinarily uh, easy life, I would say. Uh, I've. Uh, I benefited enormously from the generosity of others, and I've been able to live well and uh, do what I aspire to do. I, uh, make some things that I think are useful, and uh, you, you have to be grateful, when, especially when you realize the amount of pain and suffering that the world is full of. Mm. Agreed, completely. Well, I thank you so much for this conversation. You're very I'm, welcome. I'm grateful to you for your time and your, your sure. wisdom and your, your sure. openness. I hope the uh, series goes well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate it. So I'm Jonathan Fields, and my guest today has been Milton Glazer, signing off for Good Life Project. Mm -hmm.